Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby. What can content industry execs from around the world expect from January's NAPI Miami event? And what's the story behind the ongoing IP dispute surrounding Channel 4's The Greatest Snowman? My guests on this week's show are JP Bommel, President and CEO of NAPP, and TV presenter and format creator Tim Shaw. It's all coming up in the last telecast of 2021. Before we get into this week's show, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening to Telecast in 2021. The show has now been listened to over 35,000 times in 104 different countries, so thanks a lot for listening wherever you are. We've just launched our new website at telecast.com, so why not check out our exclusive features, which include insight and opinion from TV's thought leaders, useful articles, past episodes, exclusive downloads, and more. And we're also going to be announcing our first telecast event, so listen out for details of that coming soon. So again, thanks a lot for listening. Have a great Christmas. I hope you enjoy the show. Now, my first guest on this week's last show of the year is President and CEO of NAPI, JP Bommel. Welcome to Telecast, JP. Thank you so much, Justin. Happy holidays to you. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Sometimes it's good to be the last, I suppose. Yeah, you're in uh, New York, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, you're President and CEO of NAPI, and NAPI has been really a fixture on the calendar for content industry executives going back many years. And and it's really become the kickoff for the year's international industry TV executives. Can you give us a brief history of NAPI and tell us how the event has developed over the years? Indeed, we are, you know, the first show of the year. So NAPI is the one-stop shop for global content, if you will. So just to give you a brief history, I think we're going on 64 years now. And the industry back then, you know, was, you know, the National Association of Television Programming Executives, what we stand for, except now we're global, now we go across all platform. But at the very beginning, that P was about uh, a community of television programmers Uh, who would be going to the convention to buy shows for the year for the local stations. Because back then, the studios or any large production company were not allowed to own their own stations. So that's how it was done. Over the years, we've obviously evolved. And now we are an association whose mission is to be an indispensable resource in the evolution of content as it moves rapidly, you know, in ensuring connectivity, you know, business opportunities. And one other thing, also very important, business intelligence. So people can make educated decisions, not only in acquiring their content, but on getting it distributed and so forth. So we are a global platform with various events during the year. Obviously, pre-COVID, we had three uh, uh, physical events. And during COVID, we, we, we shifted rapidly to provide, uh, we did about five, virtual events. But that's our mission, connectivity, business opportunity, and business intelligence. Some people think of NAPP or may think of NAPP as a as a syndication market, but it's become much more than that, hasn't it? It's also got a, a very LATAM industry flavor as well, hosted. Certainly, we're talking about the NAPP Miami event, but it's, right. it's, it's evolved to become something much more international. It is. It's a global marketplace and conferences platform that that we have. And indeed, you know, because our main show is in Miami and we've always been very close to Latin America, which is, by the way, these days is an amazing opportunity. As you may have noticed, all the big streaming companies, HBO Max, Disney Plus, uh, uh, to a certain degree, Amazon, have looked at Latin America is a launch pad for their international. It's a tremendous opportunities there. So extremely important. But NAPI truly is global. We do a show in Budapest. So we have a European component during our event. In the past, I would say four or five years, 
you know, our participation of international companies, especially from Europe and Asia outside of Latin America, has grown tremendously at NetP Miami because it is now a global marketplace and content comes, which we're going to, I'm sure we're going to be discussing, content comes from all part of the world now. So it is indeed an international conference. I've been the last few years and it's uh, it's always a fabulous event. It's very enjoyable. And what I think is interesting about NAPI is that you get to meet lots of different executives from lots of different businesses from all around the world, as you say, perhaps people involved in content that you don't necessarily always come into contact with. So it's a really interesting, vibrant collection of industry executives come together. Now, we're in a situation right now of rapidly rising COVID cases that, that we're on. There's certainly in the UK, as we speak, is becoming quite another issue. You know, it's definitely the, the fourth wave, I think it is the fourth, happening right across Europe as well. We're looking at 18th of January for NAPI Miami, which is the showcase event. Give us the latest status on NAPI Miami. It's still going to be going ahead in real life. Of course, yeah. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about that, because it is indeed something uh, important. We have the safety of our members, our staff, etc. Uh, th- their safety is top mind. So we have a very aggressive uh, safety protocol. We work with uh, you know the CDC and every organization. We follow every rule. We've come up with a program called NatP Safe, which is the strongest protocol of prevention and safety on site. Uh, a vaccination will be required, will be monitoring. As you register, you'll be asked to upload your, your vaccination status. So very, very safe in the most that, that we can. Also, because we're in Miami, we're leveraging the outdoors. So a lot of activities from our, from, not only from our exhibitors, but also from networking events, will take place poolside, enjoying the the Miami weather in January. So we're pretty safe in that regard. But absolutely, safety and monitoring, we have hired a COVID specialist who's going to monitor that with us. So I would encourage people to go on our website at NatPSafe, uh, natp.com, and look for NatPSafe, where we continuously update our protocols, but we are absolutely on top of it. That's good to hear. And and actually, it takes place at the Fontainebleau Hotel, which is one of the biggest hotels in Miami, and it has got a very large outside area. This is something that we saw from uh, NEM in Dubrovnik, which is one of the first live events, if you like, to return earlier this year. They did that very successfully in terms of the vast majority of their programming did take place outside it's actually very pleasant as well so yes talk us through the highlights then of uh, this edition jp tell us about what we should be looking out for and and why tv industry executives should be coming to nappy miami this year first of all it's a very exciting time because as you can imagine it's been two years everybody wants to get back together and not just because of the pleasure of seeing each other but i think because also through the zoom meetings and stuff we've lived through in the past in the past couple of years we've been working in a vacuum so our clients and everybody is so excited to be back in that in miami not only to to talk about what they've been doing but to hear what the other guys have been doing so that's a very important component is really to get some competitive intel. So what we'll be covering at NAPI Miami this year, and again, safety program and, 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 and all uh, protocols in place, is really to dive deeply, if you will, in the transformation and the evolution of the industry, you know, forward. We really want to look, look at that. You know, what are the new deals? There are new markets, you know, yielded by streaming around the world. And how do we finance the new shows across the living? So it, we, it's really about that, you know, new deals, new market and financing. So we put together, and, and by the way, uh, our exhibitors are back, as I mentioned, from the, the, around the world. So we've basically built the conference around three components, if you will, from a conference point of view. First, you know, a financial outlook of acti- and acquisition activities and business opportunities. You know, the, the Wall Street, what is the Wall Street view 
on our business forward in the investment community and in the big check writers. And we've, we've enlisted an amazing list of executives from Kevin Meyer, the guy who built Disney Plus and who is um, an investor and a, a business owner as well in, in streaming. Uh, Jessica Riferlik from Merrill Lynch was a, a brilliant analyst on the outlook of, of the media industry. And Kevin Beggs was the chairman of television for Lionsgate. We're also going to have a chat with Jeff Saganski, who is a big investor, especially in esports and, and so forth. So, you know, really, really exciting a kickoff of the of the conference we with that. Secondly, obviously with that with there for content. NatP is all about content. So secondly, we're going to explore, if you will, the growth and the sourcing of, of content. Uh, first, you know, but looking at international drama, you know, unscripted shows, the growth of local content and the Latin summit. So, you know, basically bringing international executive, because now it is it is a global world, but to look at the the rise, and I, I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that a little later, but the rise and the importance of international drama. In other words, shows that, that, that are not produced in the U.S., but, but overseas. And lastly, but very excited about this, uh, Justin, is that we're having an advertising and marketing component in the program, and advertising is becoming such a crucial component, not only in financing of co-production, but also as a new revenue model across all platforms for for just the, the broadcasters and the, and obviously AVOD and the FAST. And we're very excited to have Laura Morin, who is the president of advertising and, and partnership over at NBC Universal, who oversees all the properties under the NBC umbrella, who's going to bring media buyers and going to have a very in-depth conversation about, you know, what's happening in the world of advertising, how you monetize your content through that model, et cetera. So we're very excited about that and having, I think we're going to have about 50 executives from, from marketing, uh, media buyers, and brands as well. So a very comprehensive program, again, to embrace new opportunities in the industry, new markets, financing across television and streaming. Streaming is embedded in the entire conference. We don't have a streaming, you know, we have a streaming panel. If streaming is everywhere now, so every panel will have a streamer on board and we, we're very excited about that. And of course, the day of three, as always, you know, is going to be about uh, the world of Latin America, the opportunities. We're doing the Latin Summit and we've got some uh, of the top executives like J.C. Acosta, Pierre Luigi Gazzolo, you know, from Univision, Acosta from uh, Viacom, uh, CBS, to take us through, and HBO Max uh, executives, to take us through the latest in Latin America as a, uh, you know, a brand new market for opportunities. So very exciting program indeed. Yeah, and and obviously since the last Nappy Miami took place, there's been a lot of developments in streaming, and particularly fast. We've seen fast taking off. Right. Forgive the pun, but faster than anybody right. would have expected. I think so. That's really good to see that being a key focus. Just coming back to the practical aspects then of how the event will will take place. You said obviously a lot of this is going to be taking place outdoors on a socially distanced level but how will your director of safety and health then oversee things like will people be wearing masks is the a traffic flow organized how will it work in practice again i'm going to encourage everybody to go into natp.com NatP, and click on natp safe for up-to-date information but, but but first you know before the event you'll be asked to upload your, uh, your your card. So so you will know the status of people. And we'll be checking with guests on a, on a daily basis to see, you know, to see how they're doing, how they're feeling, any kind of uh, update that we can get from them. And, we, and, and we'll, do, we'll do that on, on, on a regular basis. But in terms of the flow, indoors, it, uh, as you know, the Fontainebleau is very airy. It's, it's a big place. So, you know, the, the, you, you're never in, into close quarters. Some of the, the conference will take place in the ballroom. So the ballroom must be uh, retrofitted to be social distance, you know, cleaning the area many times a day. And after each session, putting, you know, wraps around the microphones and, and so forth. So 
indeed, you know, complete safety protocol all, all day long. As I mentioned, as a prevention, you know, the, before the event, there'll be a communication plan, venue safety and disinfection, and we'll, we'll hand sanitize a social distancing. But mostly during the event, as I said, the vaccination required for our events, we'll have daily health survey via mobile, we'll give complimentary face mask on site, there'll be an outdoor tent providing, you know, the, the, the option of, of being outside for those who want to watch the conference from there. Not be safe station with touch with sanitizer, disposable mask, and other safety items. Increased disinfection of the meeting space. The cleaning will be reinforced in all exhibition space, and eye contact areas will be free, frequently disinfected. And, and throughout the, the NAT people advertising out throughout the property. So a, a, a very thorough approach to being safe. The staff, the vendors, all will be required to wear a mask. People need to be vaccinated. Is that double vaccinated or would that be triple vaccinated with boosters? Because I don't know how the rollout is going internationally. Certainly in the UK, there's a huge push on the booster jab that everybody needs to have. So is in the US. So we'll double vaccination. Most of our clients, we we find out, uh, already got the boosters. So most likely th- that, but it's certainly minimum two. Yeah. Okay. How about live streaming then? Will the event be available for those who can't make the trip to Miami? The main sessions, you know, will be streamed live from our website, you know, uh, a live stream feed of, of all the, the, the major events, you know, and the major, the major talks and so forth. Yes. Okay. And how about buyers and sellers then coming to Nappy Miami? Now, my assumption is there's a lot of big companies around the world in media and may still have travel bans in place or travel restrictions in place. You know, will the big studios be there at Nat P Miami, will there be the buyers, the key buyers and the sellers that everybody wants to meet? Yes, the studios are back, you know, from Lionsgate, Viacom CBS, NBCU, Baddy J. I mean, all those will be back. We have signed up. So, so we're very thrilled with that. But to your point, what, what we're very proud of is that it's a brand new world of buyers, if you will, because of the streamers. There's such a demand for content and acquisition executives are very much looking to um, to get new content in Miami. And we have a tremendous amount of buyers from Latin America who focused on Latin America, you know, for, for that. So to answer your question, we have dedicated a buyer's program and a, a buyer's team who basically are currently, you know, working with, with all of them to facilitate their their, uh, their participation in that be but so far we're doing very well we're tracking very very well we're pacing ahead of what we were expecting from buyers from the streamers because they are so competitive with each other and stuff that they, they are indeed from netflix amazon uh, hulu and all that and also you know smaller outlets from uh, from other territories because of the new uh, business and the new opportunities and you know it, it could be hard to navigate so that piece is is helping connecting the buyers with with the sellers and with with the, we have a dedicated team that's going to be working on that we, we notice we have a, a brand new slew of new buyers from that so and the first night at the tent you know the first uh, cocktail party the networking event limited to not a big crowd we don't want a big crowd to meet the new buyers so so you know we definitely are really focusing on that okay we're all looking forward to coming back to miami again with at the fontainebleau it's a, it's a, a fantastic venue but there have been reports in the press, JP, about r- rumours, if you like, about 2023. And I know we're getting a bit of ahead of ourselves. We're no, not even come to see you in 2022 yet. But there is this rumour about Nappy in the Bahamas in 2023. Is there anything you can tell us about that? We're considering all our options, you know, and that's all I can say at the moment. All right. Well, the Bahamas would get my vote, as does Miami. It's important to consider a location that's convenient for people to access, you know, and and also we very, you know, we want to make sure that you have a good time. We've seen conversation between uh, Ted Sarandos from Netflix 
talking to a an emerging producer from the UK and and basically creating a deal right there right there and you have a Dick Wolf showing up and talking to to a broadcaster from Asia and it's remarkable that you know that's what we do that's really the high level networking is where We've, we, we've pivoted over these these years, and why you must be attending that video, or, or you miss out an opportunity to to get connected with these people. And now it's time for story of the week, where JP gets to nominate the TV industry news story that's caught his eye in the past seven days. JP, what's your story of the week? I think my story of the week amplifies what has been happening in the industry in the past year or so is the fact that I would call it local is the new global. And by that, I mean that there is such the international content. You know, there was the most popular shows that people are watching nowadays, whether it's on SVOD or mostly on SVOD, admittedly, are produced outside of the U.S. So it gave us a great opportunity, I'm happy to welcome those producers. But, you know, I was reading this, that the article I was reading about was talking, I think it's a research done by Ampere, uh, shows that 27% of the shows produced uh, now produced outside the, the U.S., you know, which uh, in 2019, before the pandemic, it was only 17%. It's a very interesting, and I think one of that trend perhaps is due to the fact that uh, international audiences, especially during the lockdowns and, and what have you, are, are getting used to get to the SVOD model, getting Netflix in the overseas, Amazon, you know, the, the, the various things. So, you know, it's interesting because 35% of the show produced have been produced outside of the, of, of the U.S. now, we say, compared to 9% of movies. So you can see how interesting that is. And and it gives a great opportunity. You know, when we talked about the shows, I, I want to mention, it's, it's obviously Netflix dominating in that area. But when you get money, has like Casa de Papel, uh, Squid Game, or Lupin, or Call My Agent, which got, you know, uh, critically acclaimed. And it, it's a tremendous thing because that those shows were produced locally, usually in local language, but with technology now, they've, they've been dubbed or what have you, have international appeal. And I think that's that's absolutely a, a tr- tremendous opportunity for, 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 for everybody. Yeah. To me, that's the story because, you know, at the end of the day, Justin, we're storytellers. You know, it's like in the music business. It's about the song. Well, in our business, it's about the story. And there's nothing more compelling than a story with authenticity that comes from a culture or a country or uh, a community that we didn't have access before. So I'm really excited about, about seeing that. As you can hear, I'm, I'm French of origin. I lived in the U.S. for so many years. When you know, But it's really really exciting to see that the world of content is coming together in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th- this is a new story in Senyal News. We'll put a link in the episode description so you can go and see JP's chosen story. And that's all about Ampere Analysis, proprietary popularity score, showing that increased share of the most popular shows are being produced outside the United States. And now it's time for your Hero of the Week, JP. Who are you nominating as your Hero of the Week? You're going to hate me for this. Oh, because okay, JP, what are you going to say? Somebody that really has impacted me in the past few weeks, and you're going to love me, you're going to hate, I don't know. It's because it's so corny. It's uh, in a sense, because everybody, it's probably everybody says Adele, you know, and I'll tell you why. Because Adele came out with the, this the great new album and all that's so you know, timely in the times we live now, which she's go very deep uh, and vulner- very vulnerable about her, her own emotion. But also what was remarkable is the show she did, uh, you know, with on CBS, you know, launching the album. And, and, and I just, you know, I can't, keep, you know, I thought that it's so interesting to see how talent and authenticity and really being go, go deep, it's a dangerous thing to do. I mean, she really opened up. So I thought that was very courageous and I thought it was very well. And I think it's going to help a lot of people say, look, it's okay to feel sad. Yeah, It's okay to do all those things. So that's why she's, she's my hero of the week because I really, I reconnected with that. Now, you know, 
Okay, well, Adele, hero of the week. Yeah, she's a bit of a national treasure here in the UK, and we're very happy to share her with the United States. I think she's made uh, made Los Angeles a new home. So, JP, who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Unkind people. Yeah, quite right. Unkind people. Nobody likes unkind. We we all need a bit of kindness, I think, don't we? Especially now, you know, what we've learned during the, the pandemic is our values, you know, and, you know, the values at Napier, excellence, respect, inclusion, you know, those things are so important that we have a tolerance for each other. So, you know, I think we've learned to love our families. We've learned to we've learned to be kind to each other. So those who don't really take advantage of being humble and self-educate them and, and uh, around what we've been through are missing a great opportunity to be to be heroes. Yeah, quite right, quite right, JP Barmore. Thank you so much for coming on Telecast this week. Really enjoyed chatting to you. I'm looking forward to jetting over to Napi, Miami. It's on the 18th of January. You can see a link to the Napi, Miami website in the episode description. I look forward to seeing you in Miami next month. I can't wait to see you either, Justin. I, I want to tell all, all your listeners that, you know, they, I, I'd love to see them in Miami, you know, to reach out to me if they have any question. But we're so excited about this year because really, as the industry rebounds, you're going to see them talking about innovation. There's a, mind, a mindset shift from our executive you know, and they've been humble enough to self-educate themselves. Uh, and what's going to be very exciting to witness is what th- we've learned. The lesson of COVID is really to be fearless and be bold, you know, in, in the future. So that's what we love about international drama, because there is no rule. And they went they, they, they went uh, absolutely in in great ways to entertain us so we, we're gonna have a, an amazing nappy miami i know it okay well uh happy holidays to you jp and we'll see you next month happy holidays thank you so much my next guest on this week's show is tv host and format creator tim shaw hi tim welcome to telecast hi justin thank you for having me it's great to have you on and and actually you're known as a tv presenter across multiple shows and channels mm. but We're not going to be talking about that aspect of your career this week. You've hit the TV industry headlines this week for an entirely different reason concerning your format development work. Yeah. And John Elms at Broadcast broke a story about an IP dispute you're having with Channel 4 over the greatest snowman show. And it's also been reported in the Daily Mail. Can you talk us through this story, Tim, and how this all happened? First and foremost, I don't want to be in a dispute with anyone. You know, uh, ultimately, I'm a creative person uh, from a creative background. My background is one of product design. So from a young age, I, I won a couple of awards as a sort of young engineer of the year kind of position for creating and designing a few high street products. And um, you learn from a young age, there's something called the you know the design process, which is a very sort of sort of a uh, distinct process that you work through when you invent anything that you come up with a need and then a brief and then it's a few different solutions you work your way through to a final product and you i i just decided from a young age that actually i love this design thing uh, I, I would like to do it more in another area in life which ended up being in media um I, I, you know, I, I realized from doing mechanical engineering at university that that wasn't, I, I thought in my naivety, that wasn't going to get me, a, you know, a girlfriend. So I decided to go into radio. So radio became my thing. But then I wasn't sort of, you know, uh, satisfying my need to be creative. So um, designing and building little objects that you could hold tangible things you could play with wasn't my thing anymore. So I decided to go into developing um, ideas for television and back in the day radio as well but I realize it's, it's an identical process you know a television show is just a product um, albeit it's on a, on a tape or on a um, in digital format it is still a product and it goes through exactly the same process of coming up with an idea and then going through a load of different iterations starting with version zero and ending up with version 4.7 having had months of working it through and the one that is the one that's best fits the, for the job and for the customer so um i had this sort of proven route to market through a selection of different production companies actually because 
while word had been spread amongst some of the big production companies, I was quite good at coming up with ideas on demand. And as John Farrer, I've had deals with um, with Red Arrow and deals with Warner Brothers as a paid development officer alongside my um, my television presenting. So it was great because I'm that guy that goes home on a Friday night now and doesn't have a drink. You know, I've stopped, you know, no alcohol consumption in my family. We literally sit around and come up with TV ideas and that's our fun Friday night. So some people would point a laugh and just be like, how boring, but that's actually what I like doing. And that's the way I've been made. So coming up with ideas has been very much my thing. Now I came up with an idea a few years ago and I pitched it um, through Nerd at the time, and it was a TV show called Experimental. Uh, it got commissioned. I actually emailed Jay Hunt myself, got to know Jay fairly well, and pitched it to her. And she sent me an email back going, Tim, there's a problem with this idea. And I was like, what's that, Jay? And she said, I like it. I want to make it. So we made a TV show, which was basically um, investigating viral videos on the Internet that involved people doing crazy things. And I, as the engineer, and Buddy Monroe as my sort of sidekick and guinea pig, would go off and try these experiments and try them do and do them bigger and better and unpack the engineering. So that, that's what that show was about. Six episodes. And I had this proven route to market then from an idea, which was, you know, wherever I came up with it, through Red Arrow and Nerd, and then through to Channel 4. And that was good. We had, we'd had a, a you know, a, a, I think it was 20, 2018, 2019, my partner, Christina, and her daughter, my stepdaughter, Millie, those two girls had had a particularly rough time in life. You know, Christina that year had lost her father and she'd had this major complication with her heart. And she had some rare syndrome called uh, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Millie had sadly at the age of 11 had lost a friend at school. One of her best friends had passed away in his sleep. It was a really tough time. And I used, um, as I still do use coming up with TV formats as escapism. It's a lovely thing to just, I hate the phrase, but blue sky think. Just go, right, you can come. There are no limitations. Just think up any any format for any show, be as wild as you want, look around you for stimulation, whatever you're looking at, you can use that and say, well, actually, could we have a show about this? Could we have a show about that? So I said, look, use it as a form of distraction from the reality of your life not being too happy at the moment. Anyway, Christina and Millie, Christina's very bright and she's always helped me um, with my development from the days of the deals with Warner Brothers and Nerd and, and Red Hour and stuff back in the day. It was February 2019 and she rang me and she was uh, excited. It was 11 o'clock at night. I was actually asleep in my hotel filming for another television show. And she rang me and she just went, Tim, the greatest snowman. I said, what? She said, I've got an idea for a format. I didn't know what she was talking about. She said, you know, we love The Greatest Showman, the movie. We've been to see it loads and loads of times. We're obsessed with it. We've just been making snowmen in the garden. It's still on at the cinemas. And why shouldn't there be a TV show called The Greatest Snowman? I said, OK, come and tell me more about it. What is it? So we worked it up into what we thought was, you know, a workable TV show or an idea for a concept. I was just going to chuck it at John from uh, John Farrow's my mate. It's one of those where I'll ring him and he'll go, hello, Tim, what have you got for me this time? And I'll go, dude, got this one, The Greatest Snowman. Now, the response annoyingly for me because i'd spent years trying to come up with these you know clever ideas for engineering based tv shows annoyingly the response from john was one of like i love it i was like no 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 you can't this christina has come up with this building snowmen in the garden no no come on he was like no i love it what is it tell me more so we we came up with the we i told him the loose idea of it being sort of celebrities and families and what have you you know out in the alps making these snowmen and making snow sculptures we'd done a bit of research to sort of flesh it out so John said to me, right, Tim, I'm going to I'm going to take it. I've got a meeting with Tim Hancock at Channel 4 tomorrow, a pitch meeting. I'm just going to chuck it in on the end. I was like, OK, mate, no, no worries. I kind of forgot about it. Christina hadn't forgot about it, but but uh, I was just like, oh, I'll carry on with my life. Two days later, John rang, John rang me back. And I remember him saying, I mean, there was a, there were a few swear words, but he said ultimately the words were slam dunk. And I went, what are you talking about? Christina was in the car. We pulled over. I put it on loudspeaker and he was just going. I've never had a response like it. He said, I've just come off the phone to Tim Hancock, who I pitched it to the other day, two days ago. And he'd, he'd mentioned it to loads of commissioners at the channel, loads of people, and they loved it. And I was like, no, don't tell me this. The greatest snowman. What? The channel can't look. He said, no, they love it. It's gone right to the top. The whole channel love it and think it's a great idea. And I think this is going to go into paid development. I was like, John, I'm like eight pages into some complicated formats, uh, you know, engineering based stuff. And you're telling me the greatest snowman is the one that's going to go into paid. He said, yeah. He said, honestly, the channel, uh, he, he kind of joked, I think they're opening champagne. He was just joking. But he was saying the bottom line is everybody was talking about it and they all loved it. And I was like, wow. OK. Anyway, the phone got put down. And I was like, this is so typical, Christina. You come up with this little basic idea, you know, this little thing. Anyway, so the idea, the challenge was then to flesh it out. And um, it did go into paid development. So, um, you know, I've, I've got all these emails and all this sort of stuff. And the channel were excited about it. What was the idea? How did it work? You know, so we actually came up with 
um, as with any product, you go through a, a design process. So we had this very basic starting point of this idea, <clears throat> which we knew was simply people building ultimately, uh, you know, a, a snowman in a wonderful part of the world. But the journey on the way was to make snow sculptures. And was it celebrities? Was it families? Was it this? This was the process. This was the you have a seed of an idea. You know, um, you know, if you, if you look at the way the iPhone is now from where it started, it's, it's you know, you, you start it with a very basic idea and you work your way through to the finished idea. And this is what this happened. This is what happened here. So it went into paid development. And ultimately, the idea was with Channel 4 for just under three months. And there were lots of conversations. And John was ringing us regularly going, we need different rounds. We need this. We need that. So we worked through three different pitch documents, which ended up being about 30 pages of A4, you know, brought to life with color, brought to life with ideas. And the finished idea that we finally got to, which was a show which is called, it's simply this, The Greatest Snowman. It was a, a 90 minute one off special for Channel 4 to be run up, uh, broadcast in the run up to Christmas. Viewers follow celebrities competing against each other to build amazing ice sculptures, snow sculptures, ending in the final round with this huge sort of snowman, this wonderful snowman. Uh, there were to be three rounds. It was to be filmed in the Alps. Experts and engineers are uh, to assist. Well, they were to assist celebrities by giving them lessons in ice and snow carving using tools and chisels and chainsaws, all that sort of stuff. Um, the celebrities uh, were to be presented with these huge blocks of ice and snow to create their sculptures. And there were going to be expert judges to sort of judge these celebs on, all competing to win the coveted greatest snowman trophy. And then there was going to be some sort of donation at the end going to charity. So that's what we worked our way through. But the reason it took such a long time is the due diligence and the feasibility of this idea. There's all It's all very well coming up with an idea, the greatest snowman. Let's go up to the Alps with chainsaws and make snowmen. But if you're taking valuable celebrities out there uh, that would be happy to sue people if an arm or a leg got chopped off or anything was injured, there was a lot of feasibility checking that need to go into this. And, you know, how big, a, how, how big an idea could this be? Is this something that could go, you know, a big format if we can work our way through it? So actually, if you follow the paper trail that we've got, you work your way through to a well fleshed out format that proved that it was feasible, the due, due, due diligence was done. And it was something that, you know, we were all excited about. Now, unfortunately, this was now June 2019. Unfortunately, what happened was it kind of fizzled out. It kind of petered out, which was something that we were all very disappointed about. We went back um, to the table. CPL at the time went back with Red Arrow and said, look, we can offer to put some money on the table if, if it's too high a budget. Because um, the tariff was quite high at the time. And we said, look, we can we can bring this down a little bit. And we were, we were still excited, but it, I remember John ringing me and saying, Tim, I know they were so over the moon about it, but it seems to have faded a little bit. You know what it's like in, in it, with anything. A new idea is only exciting for a certain amount of time before it becomes an old idea. And it, it unfortunately faded out. And we never, we never officially heard back. As far as I'm aware, we never heard back from Channel 4 to pass on the idea. So we couldn't take it anywhere else. It just fizzled out. And Christina was like, oh, it's faded, but you never know, it might come back. And the last couple of years, she's been sort of like, well, you never know, it might still get made. It might get made. Now cut to three and a half weeks ago, and my phone started pinging. And it was friends of mine in the industry going, congratulations. And actually, it was this friend up the road who'd read it in the paper. And she was saying, congratulations, you've got your idea made. And I was like, what? And then I got a text from, from John. And uh, we heard about a snow, a snow show that was being made called The Greatest Snowman. But it wasn't being made with with us. It was being made with a company called South Shore Productions, we found out. Um, and I did a bit of digging online, looking into what, what their show is. I also managed to get a copy of the treatment uh, and uh, other emails that had been sent out. You know, for people in the industry, and I just wanted to have a look at what the idea was at the time. I just thought, OK, well, it might it might be something a little bit similar, but, you know, it's, it's got the same name. That's a shame. But there we are. And then from doing my research, it appears that the format that they're making is called The Greatest Snowman. It's a 90 minute one off special for Channel 4. Viewers follow celebrities competing against each other to build amazing ice sculptures, ending with a snowman at the end. There are three rounds as well. The show is to be filmed in the Alps. Experts and engineers assist celebrities, giving them lessons in carving using tools. Celebrities are presented with huge ice blocks or snow blocks to create their sculptures. And there are judges, expert judges, all competing to win the coveted greatest ice snowman ice trophy in their in their treatment. And we've just got the coveted greatest snowman trophy in our treatment. But um, and then also some form of donation is going to charity. And it was one of those things where uh, as the dust settled and it sort of started sinking in, I just thought, well, this is this is uncanny. There are so many similarities here between the two ideas. It's it's um, it's pretty much all of them. It's pretty much the full deck. This is from the information that I've got. Now, 
I'm, I'm looking to, to be corrected on this. I'm looking to be told that I've got it wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm making a mistake. And that's not exactly what's happening because I come from a, a place of just a logical background. I have a logical head. And I just think, OK, now I do know that coincidence has happened and I can and I can appreciate that. But I found in this particular case and I might be wrong. So I don't want to, There are no accusations being thrown around here. I, I, no accusations of something untoward happening. Uh, uh, coincidences do, do absolutely do happen and coincidences that are sometimes almost improbable. So, you know, if, if I count and I feel that there are 11 coincidences here. Um, if you have, if if each one of those coincidences with a die was a dice, now here's the thing: a dice only have six six variables. So, across eleven dice, if I throw a number, and then I ask you to get the same number, the chances are a hundred million to one. Now, it's not as simply clear cut as that. It's not as clear cut as that at all, because one idea will follow another idea in the design process. So, you know, I, I understand that this might be, and people always say two people can have an identical same idea at the same time or at different times around the world. And I live in a world of product design where I completely accept that. If I invent something today, there's a damn good chance that somebody else is inventing it. But but I just want some answers from Channel Four as to how this happened. How how did they how did the the odds land in their favour? How did they do that? And how did it happen? That's all I'm looking for is an explanation that is a plausible one, considering we, we went into paid development. And from what I was told, the channel was so over the moon with the idea, but unfortunately passed on it, as we've recently found out, due to the budget. But as they've printed, as their release says from um, the guys at Channel Four, one of the main points is that South Shore are making it much cheaper, which was the big issue they had with ours. That's great for them that they are having the, the idea made much cheaper. But I just would like some answers as to how we're here. First of all, it's very unusual, isn't it, to see these sort of stories in the press because, of course, producers don't want to upset the very channels no. they're selling shows to. I wonder how often that this sort of issue occurs and, and maybe it's it's not reported as much as it actually does occur. I mean, do you get the sense uh, that it, yeah. it may be goes on across lots of different channels and lots of different production companies on an ongoing basis? I guess what you're referring to is something which might be considered untoward. And I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to refer to that in, in suggesting that that is what's happened here. I'm not suggesting that this is something that has been stolen or has been passed. I'm not saying that. I just I'm looking for an explanation. But in answer to, to that question, which as far as I'm concerned, is about a different different subject. Yes, absolutely. It's some, Since the beginning of my days in development, I've heard countless stories about people saying, Oh, I've just had an idea ripped off. My idea has been ripped off. This has been ripped off. That's been taken. But I'm, you can't say anything because you'll never work in the industry. I, I learned the term blackballed. And the funny thing is, you know, although I've been approached by quite a few people recently since this has gone in the paper saying, well, this is clearly what's happened here. I don't want to believe that. I, you know, I like Channel 4. I'm sure, you know, I, I've met Mel before. Um, she won't remember, but my agent hooked me up my meeting with her, you know, years ago, and I got on very well with her and I respect her and a lot of the shows that she's made. So I'm just looking for an explanation as what's to happen. And I really think there is a simple explanation. But yes, it does this stuff happen? Does, well, does the stuff you're in answer to your question about, you know, people in the industry talking? Yeah, I think there's plenty of that. And people are, are worried to talk openly about it. But I don't I think in this particular case, I'm, I'm hoping that that's not and I, I'm, I'm sure that is not what's happened. And there's a very simple explanation. And what could help me come to that to, to that conclusion that it is just coincidence. And, you know, the, the point is, you know, I just gave the example with dice there. And you always have to remember if if rolling those dice, it is 100 million to one. And I roll the dice again. It's 100 million to one. It is still to one. So it is still possible. And you always have to remember that that coincidence is possible. And I live in a real world of appreciating that. But my head at the moment is just saying, OK, I'm just in a position of needing some better answers from Channel 4 that actually put the questions that I want to ask to them to bed. And I go, fair enough, guys. I love Channel 4. I've presented four or five different shows from them, you know, Extreme Male Beauty, Balls of Steel, loads of other bits and bobs, even going right back to the days of um, the last word. There loads of different stuff. You know, Channel 4 for me was that that channel that you, in the 90s and the noughties you looked up to and it was the place to be as a presenter. You wanted to be there. So I, I want to be on their side on this. And I want to say, yeah, I, guys, thank you for the explanation. I really appreciate your time. Loud and clear. I'll put it to bed and forget about it. But at the moment, I'm not there. And I'm just putting on my engineering logical hat. Better answers are needed, please. Can you tell us what conversations you've had with Channel 4 since uh, this story appeared in the press or beforehand? Yeah, so CPL um, have contacted Channel 4 just to ask what's going on. 
how can you explain? Uh, and um, Ian Katz came back, he was the chief content officer, and came back and said, look, the main reason we didn't go with yours, with yours was a, a budgetary issue. There's been no piggybacking, I can assure you, no piggybacking, no borrowing, uh, and there's no cross-contamination between the two departments. So yours was pitched through format, the formats and features, and the South Shore one came through entertainment. So completely different departments. So that's, and they also say that they're massively respectful of people's IP. So we had that email from Ian explaining that, and then that was pretty much reiterated by uh, Emma Harding that was sent to John, explaining pretty much the same thing, that there's been no you know, contamination between the different departments of Channel 4, and just reiterating Ian's point so that it is, you know, it's one of those things. A budget was a big issue. There's been no piggybacking and no borrowing from any of the work that we did. I've just got a few questions or just a few logical questions in my mind I would just like to have answered. As I say, I'm not pointing the finger. I'm not accusing anyone of anything in any way, shape or form. I really am not. I just have a set of questions I would just like to have answered. And I'm sure that it will take the moments to answer them and it'll all be put to bed. And I can walk away from this going, good, fair enough. It was one of those things that happened. That's that. I should say at this point, we did offer Channel 4 and South Shore the opportunity of coming on the show to to discuss this, but they declined. But Channel 4 has given us this statement and it says, we are respectful of the IP of production companies and the ideas they bring. This is not an uncommon idea for a Christmas programme. And following a review, we are satisfied that these distinct ideas in the same area were brought to different teams at different times and developed separately. Any reaction to that statement, Tim? Yeah, that's one of my questions, actually. That's pretty much what Emma said as well. She said that she's confident there are clear distinctions between the two treatments. So my question is, what are the clear distinctions between the two treatments that you're so confident about? And I'm sure they are there, and I, I just don't think I have the information, but I think it would be nice for Channel 4 to demonstrate to me their integrity with regards to protecting people's IP. And as somebody who has had ideas commissioned before, I would like them to outline what the clear distinctions between the two are, please. How are you looking to resolve this then? There's a big company of lawyers in London that deal with this stuff that are keen to take it on. I've said to them, look, I don't want to go down that road yet. I'm a creative person that just likes to have a creative outlet. And for me, the idea of pitching more ideas to Channel 4 and getting ideas made, great. But at the moment, I'm being pushed by so many people in the industry to go legal on it. And I'm in a position where I could do that. It's not the chosen route for me. It's not what I want to do. I would rather just get some decent answers to my questions, and then I'm happy to put it to bed. Can I, can I put some more questions your way that I'm interested to get answers for? Do you want to ask those now, too? Have you got, have you yes, got them please. now? Yeah, I have, yeah. My question, one of my questions is, did one person oversee and sign off both pitches, the one that was sent through Nerd of Mine and South Shore's pitch? And if so, who was it? All right. Well, we'll give Channel 4 the opportunity to, to respond to that. We'll, we'll share that with them and, and, yeah. and see if that's something they want to respond to. Okay, so you've got some more tw- questions. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. How many similarities do you need between the two shows to set alarm bells ringing at Channel 4? And when they are set ringing, whose job is it to make that phone call to the production company to say, hi, we've had another almost identical idea pitched? And I would like some examples of where these calls have been made demonstrating a clear protection of other people's intellectual property and uh, because intellectual property is the lifeblood of any tv channel without creative people coming up with ideas there is no tv channel so that's my question to them so how many similarities are there and when the alarm bells are set ringing whose job is it and please could you give me some examples of production companies who've had phone calls going hi our system has recognized some Uh, similarity between these formats and we need to make you aware of it there's another one as well (laughs) these i've just got basically four or five questions and once these are answered which i'm sure they will be and you know competently answered then it'll be fine and you won't they won't hear from me again another question is what digital systems the channel 4 have in place to look for similarities with previously pitched ideas and to protect ip in particular between commissioning departments now i know production companies have um like endemol have you know, uh, algorithmic based systems that are scanning for similarity between previously pitched ideas with the view to protecting people's IP. So what digital systems do Channel 4 have to look for these similarities? There are quite a few available out there. I'm just wondering which one they use. Number of questions there, Tim. We'll share that with uh, Channel 4. This is today's Tuesday. The uh, show goes out on Thursday. So uh, if there are any responses, obviously we can update the show or certainly put them on our website. 
I hope you get this resolved, Tim. Yeah, I hope uh, it, I uh, and everybody gets it resolved. You know what? It's, it's, a, it's an awkward thing to talk about. It's not just that. It's an awkward place to be. It's not somewhere I choose to be at all. Not in the least. You know, I'm, I'm not getting any pleasure from this whatsoever, but I just feel, you know, I, I'm worthy of some, of, of some explanations. You know, we went through the design process, the organic evolution of this idea. It took us three months from the initial pitch to getting it to a place where Channel 4 said, yep, you know, this is the idea that we want now. But unfortunately, they didn't go with it. And, and Ian Katz in his email uh, replied also that, you know, the, the pitch from South Shore only came in a few months ago. So the email was a couple of weeks old now and, and their show's already been filmed. So let's say that Channel 4 have known about that idea. That initial pitch with those guys was four months ago. It's pretty awesome, you know, that they've gone from the initial pitch to getting it filmed when it, it took us a good couple of months just to evolve the idea to where Channel 4 wanted it. And I've been assured that there's no crossover. There's no there's no piggybacking or borrowing. And I'm sure there hasn't been at all. So I, I just wondered how that's been achieved. How have they achieved that? in such a short period of time that's that's awesome program making thank you so much for joining us uh really appreciate you uh coming on the show as i say i hope this gets resolved to uh everybody's satisfaction and uh, i wish you a very merry christmas hopefully we'll see you in the new year Christmas Eve isn't going to be quite the way it was in our family now. Unfortunately, you know, it's one of those things talking to her. Millie's now 13 and she's taking it particularly harshly because she's a logical mind. She's a very smart little girl, very smart little girl. And she's just uh, read through everything and come to her own conclusion. And Christmas won't be quite enjoyable, sadly, in our family. But hey, look, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Just I'd like to chuck in on the end. If anyone would like to get in contact with me to talk to me about anything, uh, my email address is Tim Shaw, T I M S H A W U K, Tim Shaw UK at yahoo.co.uk. So Tim Shaw UK at yahoo.co.uk. And I wish everyone, uh, you know, a very me- Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I hope this will just be resolved with some simple answers from Channel 4 and it will all be put to bed and um, I can carry on pitching good ideas to those guys. All right. Tim, thanks so much. We'll see you in the new year. Cheers, mate. Take care. Well, that's about it for the final telecast of 2021. I hope you've enjoyed listening this year as much as I've enjoyed chatting to TV's movers and shakers and top talent in London, Glasgow, Dubrovnik and Cannes. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? Just search Telecast and sign up on our new website, telecast.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited, as always, by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. We'll be back on the 13th of January 2022 with a real screen preview show. Until then, have a great Christmas break. Watch out for that pesky Omicron variant and stay safe.